autism isn't a disability that requires sympathy. It's a really valuable diversity. We, we tend to look at autism and, and people with autism as they, they have these, these disabilities, these challenges that uh, make it so difficult for them to get through the world and that they may not be able to contribute the way that everyone else can. And the truth is, is that it's a different way of being, but it's a way of being that their daily experience, the, the environment that they, they work through every day generally is totally not designed for them, right? So imagine, you know, we, we talk about like there's been this fallacy that people with autism lack empathy or that they lack social skills, right? The truth is that they don't lack empathy or social skills. They lack neurotypical empathy and social skills quick shout out from one of our awesome sponsors check this out thank you to tranquil turtle massage they are located right in the heart of downtown Coeur d'Alene and Tracy is a master massage specialist and Hanu Ashiatsu trainer look my wife and I go see her and her team every single month and we walk away feeling great sore muscles are gone we feel relaxed you got to go check them out tell them i sent you for 25 bucks off your massage package also while you're there make sure you check out cda brows body and ink offering quarterlane's best tattoo brows plasma fiber blast tightening and pmu services tell them i sent you and you'll save 100 bucks on your tattoo brows or plasma tightening make sure you check out tranquil turtle massage and cda brows body and ink at pnwmobilemassage.com <laughs> Tom, you're the co-founder of Rising Tide Car Wash and Rising Tide U. You've been listed on the Forbes 30 Under 30. Your book, The Power Potential, is out now and so much more. Thank you for your time, man. I appreciate it. Eric, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm really excited to speak with you. I'd like to start things off by going back a bit. Like, Where did you grow up? What was childhood like for you? Yeah, so um, I grew up on Long Island, uh, New York. Um, the, the reason we founded this business is very... Um, it very much due to my family's history. And so my brother, Andrew, has autism. And he's my younger brother by a little under two years. And uh, growing up with him, we, you know, I personally saw a, a lot of his struggles, and, uh, but also a lot of his strengths, right? He, he worked so hard as a kid. Uh, he, you know, he dealt with things that most of us don't have to deal with. And yet he, he still every day had a positive attitude, really worked hard, really just tried to be, you know, a, a good child and eventually a good man. Uh, and, you know, luckily, um, you know, my, my family uh, was successful. My dad's a successful entrepreneur. And, and um, when it was time for me to graduate college, it was trying to figure out, well, how can I, how can I kind of use the privilege that I've had in my life to do something good? And, uh, I wasn't necessarily thinking about doing anything uh, around autism, but, you know, I always kind of wanted to do something impactful. And once I graduated, uh, you know, seeing Andrew kind of, you know, he graduated high school, but there wasn't really anything for him after high school. He was doing like an adult day program uh, and just kind of going back to the same classroom that he had been going to for years. And it became really clear really quickly to both my father and I that we were going to have to do something in order for Andrew to lead the full adult life that we knew he was capable of. So uh, my dad being being the consummate entrepreneur and me kind of wanting to go down a similar path at that point, uh, we said, okay, let's try to build something that can employ Andrew and, and maybe uh, lots of other people like him and do it in a way where it's viable and, um, you know, can potentially scale and, and, and help a lot of people. So we looked at a bunch of different industries and we eventually came to the car wash industry, really liked it because um, for a couple of reasons, namely because we felt it would be a really great opportunity for Andrew and it would use his strengths and the strengths of what we thought many people with autism possessed at the time. And it was also an asset backed business. So if it failed miserably, at least we still had a car wash that we could sell and it wasn't all, <laughs> you know, sure. totally, um, you know, gone with the wind. Um, but yeah, so luckily it's been it's been really successful. We we took a, a car wash that we purchased in 2012. Uh, when we bought it, it was washing like 35,000 cars a year. To now, it's washing over 170,000 cars a year, and we were able to leverage that into two more locations. And we're currently employing a little under 100 people with autism, including my brother Andrew. He does great, and the whole crew is is awesome. And 
yeah, it's been a really wonderful experience so far. Man, what what a cool story of how that all came together, man. So so cool. You and your dad, you co-founded this thing, uh, Rising Tide Car Wash. You've been featured in Entrepreneur Magazine, Fox News, you know, Forbes, Inc., Today Show, and more. Why do you think? What do you think has made Rising Tide Car Wash so successful? Yeah, um, I think there's a few things. Most importantly, though, is that uh, we have a, a team that really wants to be here. And so our staff is 80% people with autism and our team members genuinely enjoy that the, you eat each other as well as want to do a really good job at work. And that is, um, you know, that's an experience our customers feel. It's an experience our customers want to be a part of. And, you know, in order to make that mission work operationally, you know, that's a, a pretty large constraint for a business, right? It, um, Certainly our team members with autism have wonderful strengths, but they also, it's a, it's a subset of, of uh, the talent pool and one where while they have many excellent strengths, they also often have challenges that are much more apparent than your typical workforce would have. So we had to design really every aspect of our business to empower them. You certainly cannot uh, marginalize 80% of your staff. Your, these, these are employees with autism do every aspect of this business from greeting our customers to guiding them onto the conveyor, to actually cleaning the cars, to providing great customer service, to doing maintenance, you know, all the way through and through. Uh, and so we had to build really good organizational systems to support them effectively. And what we found was that while they have some um, challenges that may be more apparent than your normal workforce, they're the same challenges that everybody else has. They are just are more apparent, which makes mm -hmm. it, in fact, I think, in my opinion, easier to solve for because uh, these they're not like uh, there's no question if there's a problem. It's obviously there's a problem and we have to figure out how to fix it. And eventually and generally we come to solutions that are, are better for everybody and, and better for our entire team and better for our customers and makes it easier for us to grow as an organization as well. Hmm. Come on. And, I, and I, it looks like in the videos that I've seen online, like the team that you have set up they just love to be there. And I think I saw a video on Facebook where you recently did a promotion for one of the, the gentlemen that was on your team, super tall guy. Yeah. Uh, but when yeah. you gave that promotion to a man that his face lighting up, man, I was like, Oh man, I love that. Like his emotion was like so pumped up that he was getting that, man. It was such a cool video. I'm so glad you bring that up because I, that was like such a awesome moment that was at our, our Christmas party. And you know, he had been working, Sean had been working for that promotion for years and okay. he's really bright, incredibly hardworking, and just like genuinely one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. He really struggled with confidence when he got to us. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, anything that was new or different, like it was, it was really anxiety producing for him. And, and frankly, I think he'd been told for a large portion of his life that like he couldn't do these things. So right. when he got to us, there was a lot of unlearning that needed to happen. And slowly but surely, he gained confidence. He learned new skills. He got better and better. He had some successes. And eventually, you know, he's now he, he's a, you know, fully a supervisor, right? We don't let, we, we never give people promotions uh, that they don't earn. Like it's very merit-based. So he can do everything that any of our other supervisors can do. If a customer claims damage on their vehicle, he's out there helping the customer. If the customer uh, wants a special service done or, or needs help, he's there. He closes the money at night. He opens the location in the morning. Uh, he coaches our team. He trains other people. And yeah, I mean, he was incredibly pumped to get yeah. that promotion. Yeah. He actually lifted me. I don't know if you saw in that video. He lifted me up over his shoulder. And <laughs> I, I was like, you know, three, four feet suspended in the air. I was like, oh my God, what's about to, I'm about to get dumped right. over the back of his shoulder right now. <laughs> Um, it was so good. It was so good. And I mean, it was yeah. it, it just like a nice microcosm of, of how a lot of our team members feel where this is a real sense of pride. Uh, it produces a real sense of pride. It's a real sense of achievement. And it's also a community where they feel comfortable and that they can excel in. Uh, and, and I think all that, again, it culminates in an experience for our, our customers that is, is rare, right? You don't normally get something like that at a, a retail business when you're trying to check off one of your chores from your list, you know, sure. it's, it's, um, and that cre creates a really nice advantage for us as a, as a business. Yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, just the, your, 
the team members that were there, like celebrating that promotion was awesome to see like how excited they were even. Yeah. So cool to see that. <laughs> For sure. So Tom, you've got the book, The Power Potential, How a Non-Traditional Workforce Can Leave You to Run Your Business Better. It's available everywhere. It's been endorsed by Seth Godin. Like what's that journey that you take readers through in this book? Yeah. So we, essentially the book is centered around our experience of trying to find that people with autism really are extreme users of organizational systems, that they have the same needs as everybody else, just more apparent. And but by designing for and with team members with autism, we've really been able to unlock and uncover four problems that most organizations and specifically small, medium sized businesses face. And then also creating some really wonderful benefits based on on solving these problems. And those problems are that you're hiring based on on interviews, uh, which is tends to be a, a really um, bias system that yep. you think that great talent is the secret to a great business. So instead of trying to build a business that can develop talent, we're focused on just trying to bring in great talent, which isn't always feasible, as well as that your managers are good enough, right? Our, our B and C managers tend to be like the slow death to a lot of employees' experiences. Yep. And um, then also that you're firing your worst employees because often they are the ones who hold the key to you being able to design systems and, and, and organizational structures that work better for everybody. And by just writing them off as, oh, well, they're not good enough, they're not competent, instead of really taking a hard look at, is the business failing them or are they failing the business? And by going through that process, we've really been able to uncover uh, a a and unlock some really significant improvements in organizationally for us, our psychological safety, being able to ethically hold people accountable, being able to drive purpose through the whole organization, and that culminates in an experience that customers really enjoy and, and a brand that they want to be a part of. I think I've experienced all four of those problems in my career, man. <laughs> like <laughs> that's, that's, it's so true, man. And, and um, man, if, if businesses need to read this book, because even just that, that first one where you talked about the, the interview based off of, you know, interviews, I've been in interviews where it was like, five or six interviews deep. And the last one was like a top grading interview. And it's like mm. two hours sitting there and you're like, man, what is happening right now? Like, exactly. <laughs> so yeah. true. One of the lessons that you talk about though, in this book is how to design purpose into everything you do. How do folks figure out what their purpose is? Yeah. So I think um, we tend to, especially organizationally, like think about purpose that it's this big, it's gotta be this big, you know, save the rainforest or end climate change or, or, you know, solve world hunger. And while of course those are super admirable goals, uh, a daily experience of purpose doesn't necessarily have to do with any of that. It has to do with us feeling like we're making a difference, but we're making a difference to our people, to our team, to an individual customer. Uh, that's how we tend to experience making a difference on a daily basis. Uh, that we feel like we're growing, right? We're, we're not stuck in a place where we're not learning anything, that we're not becoming better people, that we don't have any path to growth. We have no future with the organization. Uh, and that we have relationships at work, right? The people next to you tend to drive your purpose at work, tend to drive your experience at work in general. If you love your boss, if you love your peers, you're much, much more likely to experience work as not just something I have to go do to earn a paycheck so I can live, but something that I actually want to do and I, I enjoy doing and, and it gives me meaning and fulfillment and belonging. Mm, man, so good. Through your journey on this, you know, of creating Rising Tide Car Wash, and we'll get into it too, but Rising Tide you like what's the greatest lesson that you've learned and what's the hardest lesson that you've learned throughout the process? I, I think the most... The thing that I go to all the time, and I, I have to like continuously relearn this, is that context is king, right? Mm -hmm. So much of what can what 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 happens around us and the way people react to us and the way people react to situations has to do with the, the context of that actual um, situation, right? Is there you know did this person just experience a breakup? Did they 
just, you know, fail a test at school or did they come to work? Do they not eat breakfast and they're really hungry? Are they, um, you know, did, did, have they just been experiencing this little annoying friction all day at work that, you know, that just drains their cup and now something bad happens and they explode, they fly off the hinges. And, you know, when I, whenever we experience some sort of problem at, at work, I really try my best to get a, uh, an objective understanding of what's going on around me, right? Like, why do you, you know, why do people around me think something happened? And I may have a different opinion and I may still have a different opinion at the end of it, right? But at least now I can understand everybody's perspective and the con and as much of the context surrounding an issue where a lot of times that practice leads to us finding solutions that are a lot more simple than you would think. Right. Um, yep. you know, we give, we give an example in the book. It's like a really simple example, but, um, we had a, a van that was driven by a, a, um, a customer who was kind of abrasive. Uh, he was, uh, essentially was like very demanding. He needed to go through the car wash. My, my person who was greeting them was new and she was unsure of herself. So she just let him through and he get, ends up getting stuck in the car wash. And it was a, it sucked. <laughs> uh, we yeah. were able to, able to get him out. And like, we, we have a system for this, right? We had a stick that was essentially the, the, the maximum height. Like if you're taller than the stick, you can't go through the car wash, but because he was being, you know, abrasive and, and hard to deal with this, you know, team member who was not sure of herself at this time, just like, okay, just go like, it's fine. And that led to an issue. You could look at it like, okay, well, she didn't follow the process, your, your process, she didn't follow your rules. She's the reason that this happened. You just need somebody who's more assertive, right? Uh, in that role. Right. You could look at it that way. Or you could say that um, there's, maybe there's a, a way where we don't have to create friction with a customer and it's, it can be a really obvious, seamless experience. And, and there is, and of course, it's one that exists that you've seen at many businesses, we just didn't have it at this time, which is just a, a basic clearance bar, right? That little yellow bar that hangs off the, you know, the, the roof. And if, if you hit the, that clearance bar, you know it, and there's no arguing right. that it's too tall or not. <laughs> and <laughs> right. And we could have, you know, could have just been like, okay, Shan, like you're out, like you didn't do your job. You just caused a whole bunch of damage. Goodbye. Or, and, and, and luckily we didn't do that. And we were like, okay, like what happened? Like, let's hear it. Like, how did it, and we ended up coming to a better solution that now we implemented at all of our stores and we don't really have to worry about vehicles that are too tall going through the car wash anymore. It'd be really difficult for that to happen. Right. Wow, man. God, I want to, I want to, man, this, I love this story, man. Thank you so much for taking time to do this. This is, this is so good. You are the co-founder of rising tide you, which is so great, man. Can you deep dive into what rising tide you is and what's the mission of that? Yeah. Yeah. So, we founded Rising Tide U because, um, so in 2014, and then subsequently in a couple of times over the next few years, we had some major media pieces. We were, we were featured on the nightly news. Uh, we had a video go like super viral on social media. And when those things happened, we got like just a ton of emails from other family members, essentially that are, you know, have, have autism in their family and are kind of struggling with the same questions as we were. Like, what would Andrew do? What would their child do when they became an adult? Uh, and they're, you know, people that want to do just like us, right? Okay, oh, how can we do what you're doing in, in our community? And, you know, car washes are fairly capital intensive, so it's not necessarily the right option for a lot of families. Uh, so people had other business ideas and it, it was far too time intensive for us to be able to like talk and work with each one of these people um, to help them. So what we decided to do is, okay, let's start sharing our knowledge. How can we effectively share what we've learned in this business? So we, we partnered with University of Miami and, and built an online course uh, called the Autism Advantage to kind of walk uh, families through this process of like, how do you identify and test uh, and start a business that can effectively employ in, in, a, in a sustainable way uh, their, their loved ones with autism. And that was a really, really interesting experience because um, what we found was that there are certainly people like us that are, are doing that. There's been many examples. Uh, we've had a bunch of people go through the course and em employ people with autism. 
Uh, but what was really more striking wasn't the people who it was beneficial to, but to the whole host of people that it's a big ask to become an entrepreneur when you're like 55, 60 years old, simply because you have a loved one with autism and like, you feel like this is the only way to support them. Like that's, that's a pretty difficult way to become an entrepreneur. As you know, Eric, this is a long, tough road and um, you're really starting some starting behind the eight ball when you're, when you're in that type of like reluctant entrepreneur mindset. Um, yeah. So what we thought and really what was the inspiration for this book was, well, maybe we can find people who work within companies who also maybe they're affected by autism or maybe they just have business problems that we can help fix by employing people with autism and designing an organization that can effectively employ people with autism and, and anyone else. And, you know, so because of that, we wanted to kind of share what we've learned from a business practical, tactical perspective. Uh, and, and that's uh, how the, the, the power of potential came to be. And I'm sure we'll continue to find ways to share what we've learned in this business as we grow it. So we take our next phases, hopefully we'll continue to grow and scale to a nationwide organization. And every time we take the next step, we'll try to get that information out there so other people can, can emulate it. Come on, man. I love that dude. What's your message to the world? Ah, what is my message to the world? <clears throat> that autism isn't a disability that requires sympathy. It's a really valuable diversity. We, we tend to look at autism and, and people with autism as they, they have these, these disabilities, these challenges that uh, make it so difficult for them to get through the world and that they may not be able to contribute the way that everyone else can. And the truth is, is that it's a different way of being, but it's a way of being that their daily experience, the, the environment that they, they work through every day generally is totally not designed for them. Right. So imagine, you know, we, we talk about like there's been this fallacy that people with autism lack empathy or that they lack social skills. Right. The truth is that they don't lack empathy or social skills. They lack neurotypical empathy and social skills. The way that neurotypical people think and interact in a social situation is different than the way that they interact. But we're labeling them as no, they're, they, they can't do it. They don't have social skills. They don't care about social skills. No, they do. They just, they, they experience that differently. And that's just the subset of really everything that they experience in a world that wasn't designed for them. And so, so it's getting back to that context, right? Like context mm -hmm. is the, the reason we, you know, people with autism tend to have challenges is because the context that they experience was not built with them in mind. And mm -hmm. um, as we try to build things that are more inclusive, that, that work for them, uh, we end up deriving these types of solutions that are simply just better, cleaner, simpler, uh, more consistent, more scalable solutions. And, and that, you know, that's what I do every day. And I try to, I really, um, I really enjoy it. I really enjoy that process of finding these, these problems, these everyday problems and coming up with, with uh, elegant ways to fix them. I love it. I love to uh, finish my show off with a fun question. I'm a big music guy. So I'm to ask the question, like what's a favorite band or favorite type of music for you? So um, my favorite band is, it's like a, probably a random one, but it's Modest Yahoo. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm not a, not a big rap guy in general, but I love his, his music, his message is just so incredible in my opinion. And if yeah, I'm not listening sure. to Modest Yahoo, I like country music as well as house music, depending on my mood or what I'm doing. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so funny, man, Tom, you're an absolute world changer. I love what you got going on with rising tide car wash, man. Unbelievable, dude. You are impacting lives, not only in the Florida area, but nationally, globally, man, that are, that are people are coming across your, your website. And I'm so excited for this book to be in the hands of people that need to be reading this thing, man. So thank you so much for taking time. I so appreciate it. Eric, it is my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on the show and, and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation with you.
Thank you so much for checking out the show today. I really appreciate it. I hope that my guest was able to bring you some amazing wisdom and knowledge to help you continue to fight for your goals, your dreams, and your purpose. If you could do me one big favor and just hit that subscribe button, I would so appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time. Keep changing the world. I believe in you. Have an amazing day.